Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful time. Welcome to Williams, back to Williams. Good afternoon. This is uh, really thrilling to welcome you to the eighth annual Dwelling of the Gallant, where we take time to recognize, honor, and celebrate the women of Williams by sharing in the stories and experiences of featured alumni speakers from across classes uh, who are celebrating their reunions. With the celebration of 1972's 50th reunion this weekend and 1971's postponed 50th celebration in August, we recognize important early milestone in the college's history of co-education. So in the spring of 1971, seven women walked across the Williams commencement stage to receive diplomas for the first time in the college's history. And then in the fall of 1971, the first four-year class of women and men arrived on campus, and the class of 1972 subsequently graduated 44 women who had transferred into the college and includes many more who spent extensive time time here as exchange students. These early women of Williams were pathbreakers, and on behalf of all who followed, please uh, let me thank them and help me join, join me in doing so. By expanding access to women and others who had not historically been included at Williams, the college doubled down on its commitment to educating those who could not go into the world, I'm sorry, those who could go into the world to make a difference. As a result, our impact is all the broader and deeper. And this is something that Jack Sawyer really understood uh, when he moved to do uh, towards pursuing co-education at the college. Early efforts to diversify the student body evolved into important and sometimes challenging efforts to ensure that women felt the same sense of belonging at Williams. And we continue to strive to be an inclusive learning community in which all can thrive. This essential work is ongoing uh, and often remains quite challenging. We have deep commitments to caring, collaboration, and dialogue across differences as we believe we, uh, this transforms how we relate to one another and to the world around us. So as we mark more than 50 years of co-education at Williams, we look towards 2050 as the year we project the Williams Society of Alumni will finally achieve gender parity. And if you've not yet done so, please mark your calendars for the first ever Women of Williams Conference to be held on campus next year from May 19th to 21st, 2023. Just as that program will be, today's event in part it is part celebration, part critical reflection, and part forward momentum. It is an invitation to dwell with the gallant till the suns and mountains nevermore shall be. The women on the stage today all experienced very different Williams, and their journeys have led them here to share their stories of hope, disappointment, resilience, struggle, pride, shame, becoming, and gallantry. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Kitty Babson, class of 1972, Nanette Enrique, class of 1987, Danielle Dean Ryan, class of 1997, and Alejandra Moran Olivas, class of 2017. I hope you'll refer to the print program for a full introduction of today's speakers, but um, I would like to briefly introduce them to the stage before I turn it over to them. So Kitty Babson from the class of 1972. Kitty is an Episcopal priest whose primary work has been conducted in what she calls the edgy places, places that are far from the institutional center, but close to people of difference whose other insights into the life of spirit have always enlightened and inspired her. Her experiences as a member of the second Williams and in India group in the fall of 1971 propelled her continuing study of other religions and her choices to commit to non-traditional ministries. She went on to study at the Protestant Theological Seminary of Virginia and would later serve as assistant pastor of the International Church of Bangkok and chair of the board of the United Nations International School in Vietnam. She also initiated a ministry of annual travel into Myanmar, which continues to this day. Kitty now serves as chaplain at her local hospital. She occasionally preaches and looks forward with hope that she will be able to resume her annual visits to Myanmar. Nanette Enrique is class of 1987. Nanette 
currently serves as Chief Advancement Officer at the Hotchkiss School. In this role, she leads the strategic and operational vision for the Alumni and Development Office, including an ambitious campaign that will enable the school to achieve the broad strategic priorities of expanding access and strengthening community at Hotchkiss. An accomplished and respected advancement leader, Nanette has held positions in advancement at St. Luke's School in Connecticut, the Boys and Girls Club of Greenwich, and the East Asian Institute of Columbia University. In her work, Nanette has been praised for establishing collaborative and inclusive cultures, both mission and results driven. Danielle Dean Ryan from the class of 1997 has devoted her career to her passion for forging equitable climate crisis solutions. Currently, she serves as the director of equitable climate solutions at the Bezos Earth Fund. Previously, Danielle was a senior advisor to the Libra Foundation, a National Academies of Science Deep Decarbonization Committee member, director of the Inclusive Clean Economy Program at the Nathan Cummings Foundation, senior advisor for external affairs for the Obama administration, and Green 2.0's founding executive director. Danielle also launched the new constituencies for environmental program at the Hewlett Foundation and managed the commission to engage African Americans on energy, climate change and the environment at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. And lastly, but certainly not least, Alejandra Moran Olivas, class of 2017. During her time as an undergraduate Williams, Alejandra served as a teaching assistant, a tutor, a JA and on jab, and member of the track and field team where she cultivated community among her peers, especially fellow students of color and those who identified as first gen and or low income. As a student, she collaborated with the Dean's Office to create what is now known as Williams First, initiatives to better support first generation students and those who were the first in some way to attend Williams. Upon graduating from the college with a double major in biology and psychology, she worked in the Office of Admission here at Williams for four years, where she served on the diversity recruitment team to bring other exceptionally talented students to campus. Alejandra just finished her first year of medical school at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine, where her studies focus on health care for underserved populations. So please join me in warmly welcoming these four alumni. We'll begin with remarks from Kitty. Imagine summer 1970, just before the first graduating class began its studies. While anticipating my exchange here at Williams, I received a handwritten note from a professor whose course I had signed up to take. Catherine, I've received the roster of students who have enrolled in my course and see that you are on the list. I do not know you or your capacity for academic rigor, but since Williams has made the decision to transition into a co-educational institution, I believe I am obligated to give you a place in my course. <laughs> However, I want you to know that all the students who have ever taken film criticism with me have been elected to Phi Beta Kappa in either their junior or their senior year. If you do decide to proceed, I will do my best to help you manage the work I expect. Sincerely, dot, dot, dot. Oh, wow. <laughs> Surprise and welcome to Williams. <laughs> Once here at Williams, everyone I met welcomed me warmly. So my detractor was a one-off. The one downside was that while I had held on to my place in my detractor's course, I hadn't won a place in the Shakespeare course that had been one of my top priorities. Cruising the course catalog for a replacement, I found something new and different, an art history seminar on the tradition of Mughal painting in India. I signed on to take what would be my first steps away from the classical Western steeped studies that had been the educational norm of my life. I borrowed necessary books from Brad Babson, a classmate who had just returned from India where he had studied as a member of Williams in India I, the year-long study and immersion 
exploration of Indian history and culture that was the brainchild of the political science professor, Bob Gaudino. In my newfound course, I discovered an artistic tradition of extraordinary discipline and beauty. The lack of classical Western perspective revealed a spiritual death I had rarely encountered before. Vibrant color, jewel-like forms, and a rich vocabulary of meaning wowed me. My worldview tilted eastward, wooing me to apply to Williams in India too, the second Gaudino-inspired immersion experiment. Yet a prerequisite for acceptance into the program was that I needed to change my student status from exchange to transfer. The last question in my transfer interview wasn't surprising. Kitty, what do you think you might do with your education after Williams? But it was my answer that was the surprise. The Episcopal Church does not ordain women now, but when it does, I believe I'm called to be a priest. At that, my interviewer and I locked eyes for what seemed an eternity of wordlessness within which I knew that he knew that I knew I had completely surprised myself. <laughs> Williams accepted me, so did Williams in India too, and I was ordained a priest of the Episcopal Church 20 years later. This is an interesting slide. Our daughter, Augusta, class of Williams 2000, son Oliver, class of Williams 97, here today with his daughter Skylar, who knows what class she might be, myself, and Brad Babson, class with me of 72. My time in India proved indelibly formational, inspiring me to begin charting my life committed to intellectual, spiritual, and interfaith dialogue across boundaries of difference that have taken me to some of the world's furthest edges. But in India, one formidable social boundary is that single, unchaperoned young women drive negative judgment and desire. So it happened that alone and delirious with dengue fever in a Rajasthani guest house, I survived a harrowing nighttime rape attempt. After battling my assailant at the flimsy door of my room for what seemed forever, I saved myself by throwing the contents of a bottle of purple India ink at him. And branded, he ran. In the morning, a soft knock at my door and a voice that called me by name roused me from my delirium. There stood Mr. Katari the scruffy Hindu founder of the little Rajasthani Folklore Institute where I had come to study. His beetle knot habit had stained his full lips and old teeth red. Gently, he said, please pack your bag and come with me. And without a second thought, I did. He steadied me down the stairs. Outside, he lifted me into his pony cart and took me to his home where his wife and daughter helped me into a darkened room and lifted me into a freshly made bed. Sleep, they said. I do not know for how long I did. That misadventure, my survival, and how the most unexpected of people cared for me sits at the core of my memory and my theology. Both life-saving and life-changing it linked me in real time to the biblical parable of the Good Samaritan. Meeting my own Good Samaritans transformed my appreciation of how the wisdom of well-designed story reveals important truths about what it means to be human, to do good, and to be fully alive. Sharing lessons out of India, Brad Babson and I married in August 1972 and began building our lives together as engaged internationalists. Brad is a world banker and myself as a priest. A critical turning point came when Brad rejected an offer to head the World Bank's Indonesia office so I could initiate the ordination process and begin my theological studies. So I promised him, just let me get through seminary and ordination, 
and then if you were ever offered an overseas position again, I will follow you anywhere because there are ministries to be served everywhere and I will figure it out. So it happened that within weeks of my December 1992 ordination to the priesthood, I followed Brad to Bangkok where he began his new position as head of the World Bank Southeast Asia office and I began a ministry at Christ Church Bangkok a uniquely independent church of the Anglican Communion that had operated for 150 years as an Anglican Episcopal Church welcoming all Protestant Christians. In anticipation of service at Bangkok's religious crossroads of world religions, in seminary I had studied Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism because I believe leadership in our increasingly globalized world asks that one be knowledgeable about one's own culture and tradition and be prepared to converse respectfully with others about their own. Yet, within two weeks of our arrival in Bangkok, the Chinese Anglican Bishop of Singapore orchestrated an ecclesiastic coup and took over Christ Church. Adamant and unopposed, he called me an anathema and cast me out because I am a woman. It was a rude awakening it was rude because he intentionally treated me and spoke to me like a dog, and it was an awakening because I woke up. Honestly, I believe I would not have noticed new possibilities in my life if it, everything had proceeded according to plan. I would not have discovered the ecumenical richness of the International Church of Bangkok. I might not have become a member of a small interfaith company of lay and ordained Christians and Buddhists who designed and led a service to commemorate the 25th death anniversary of the great modern monk and interfaith pathmaker Thomas Merton, who had died in Bangkok of accidental electrocution in 1968. Nor would I have found my way into Myanmar for the first time for a seminary friend's consecration as one of Myanmar's six Anglican bishops. Moving by choice to Hanoi, Vietnam in mid-1994, Brad began opening the World Bank's first office in Vietnam after the American War and devastating post-war economic policies had impoverished the country. But I was cast out again, this time from a, a small ecumenical worship group whose members argued that their three Roman Catholic priest members would suffer visa reprisals if their superiors knew they were consorting with a woman priest, whom Pope John Paul II had just declared was not even to be discussed by Roman Catholics in any context. Again, surprised by grief, I was yet unexpectedly elected chair of the Board of Trustees of the fledgling United Nations International School of Hanoi. One of my primary leadership responsibilities was to negotiate with Vietnamese authorities in all ways necessary to grow the school to serve the influx of children, of parents coming to staff new embassies and international NGO and business offices, helping to move Vietnam into the international community. My newfound volunteer position as the English teacher of the Vietnamese doctors and nurses at Hanoi's Surgical Teaching Hospital was my most rewarding work of all because all of my students who had been Viet Cong medics on the trails of war offered me rare insight into Vietnam's history and culture and became lasting friends. In time, the government's Office of Religious Affairs allowed me to establish an English language church for Protestant expatriates. It was a challenge to help homesick expats learn to appreciate the strangeness of Vietnam. One sermon in which I interpreted the parable of the Good Shepherd within Vietnam, where there are no sheep, but many ducks and herdsmen who protect them not from wolves, but from snakes, was God is my duck herd. <laughs> it worked. Since 1993, I've worked in Burma, Myanmar, to mitigate its people's deprivations and isolation. 
and where, as adjunct faculty at Virginia Seminary, I led a month-long Williams in India-inspired immersion I designed for its students. Burma's abject poverty and its military's anti-Christian, anti-Muslim extremism can be so shocking that there was always a student who self-protected within a cloak of, of, of avoidance, but most met Burma's challenges with self-examination that was hard but good. Today, given widespread COVID in Myanmar and the repercussions of the Burmese junta's abrogation of the country's 2020 election, I wait a safe time to return. On hold in Maine, I have designed and managed a Zoom-delivered program to prepare ethnic Karen immigrants from Myanmar for native language leadership in American Episcopal churches. And through Western Union financial transfers, I support an English language preschool, a youth training program, and a medical clinic in a poor area where there are no schools, nor an accessible hospital. I also serve my own local hospital as a volunteer chaplain. Along the way of these 50 years, I have learned to shift my way of looking in much the same way as one must adjust one's sight to find the other image in a figure and ground configuration. It is having to find what's there that's the rub. When one doesn't have to find it, vision may hold as it is. Of course, my story is is full of the me, myself, and I, as anyone's account of her life will be. Yet looking back since my 1972 graduation, I know that much of who I have become had its inspiration here at Williams. I was here, it was here that I persevered when my very presence was challenged and roughed up. It was here where I learned that risk has its own rewards. I do believe Bob Gaudino was right, that stepping off the beaten path to risk discomfort and failure in an edgy unknown, to test oneself within dimensions of difference, where one will meet odd others and have strange adventures, can stretch intellect, hone self-discipline, and focus vocation and sharpen the acuity of the heart. All told, the steadfast surprise and delight of my life has been the love I have enjoyed with my Williams classmate and best friend, Brad Babson, and the wonder I feel when watching our two children and five young grandchildren, all so different, and the eldest of whom, Skylar, is with us today with her father, Ollie Babson, who is celebrating his 25th reunion. As they encounter the world's surprises and their own, I hope my story and the lessons I have learned along my way will encourage them to test and risk themselves more than I believe one can do as richly within a singular framework of design and experience, and to reach for the wisdom otherness offers, and to choose to build opportunities for others to live lives that are all about reaching for the stars. Thank you. And, and now I pass you to Nanette. That was beautiful. Oh my gosh. My Williams journey started with a question. Where are you going next year? Matt Dunn, who was a year ahead of me in high school and at the top of his class, said, Williams College. And I said, where's that? I am an American the first born on US soil on both sides of my family. If you ask my mom where she was going in 1962, she was going to America. She was going to finish her medical residency, but her journey was much bigger than that. She was going to pursue the American dream. In her wake, my father and brother and sister would follow from the Philippines to Cleveland, Ohio. My birth in 1965, represented another milestone as we put down roots in this country and climbed the ladder of opportunity and success. Pursuing a great education was part of that dream. My paternal grandmother always said, education is something no one can ever take away from you. A few months after I asked Matt where he was going, I received a hefty envelope in my mailbox. 
It was the Williams College View Book. On the cover were the Berkshire Mountains, ablaze in fall colors. Nestled in its bosom were the quintessential New England buildings of brick and white clapboard. This, I thought, was the college where a real American would go. <laughs> so where was I going? I was going to Williams. When I think back on my college days, I will admit I don't remember in detail my time in the classroom. I remember the cold, crisp days on the field hockey field with my teammates, racing down the field in our plaid kilts. I remember hanging out in the freshman quad, 80s music pouring out of someone's boombox, and Jimmy Reicheld singing No, No, Nanette from the doors of William Z. I remember the vanilla ice cream slowly melting over my grilled honey bun while I studied in the Baxter snack bar the smells of sugar and cinnamon wafting over my open notebook. I remember printing out my papers in Jessup, often at the last minute, like very last minute, and then hurriedly ripping off those thin strips with the holes off the sides of the paper. <laughs> I remember getting ready for parties with Ann Noel, Laura, and Kirsten in Gladden while we were putting on our makeup. I remember the first time I laid my eyes on my husband, Mark, over there, on Spring Street between early practice sessions my junior year and his freshman year. I remember eating lunch with Professor Peter Frost, whose enthusiasm not only sent me but countless others to Japan after college. These snapshots in my memory say a lot about who I am and how I move through the world. I thrive on social connection and remember the small moments, the ones betwixt and between. They play like TikToks in my head, with full-on sight, sounds, smell of vision, and touch of vision. Perhaps they would go viral, as they are full of good vibes. One thing I do remember from all those English classes I took is the power of storytelling. Each panelist is telling stories today, and we listen and learn. As a fundraiser, I've learned to listen to people's stories and the values and needs that make up the tapestries of their lives. Our stories are important. They yearn to be heard. As I think of how William shaped me and how I then have shaped the world in my own small way, I think about the stories I've told myself over the years. The stories we tell ourselves can harm or heal. Before Williams, while at Williams, and for decades after Williams, I acted out a storyline that many immigrants and their children may have internalized, and that is the story of cultural assimilation. Lose your language, lose your cultural identity, at least in public. Lose who you are to become American. That narrative had me in its grips as a young college student at Williams. I clung to that narrative like a life raft. I made it my own personal mission to work hard to conform to the majority culture. It turns out that what looked like a life raft was an anchor. What looked like the path of acceptance was actually internalized shame. Even with all the trying, the right haircut, the right clothes, the right activities, speaking English without an accent, the right schools, I found plenty of evidence and acts of racism and exclusion out in the world and on media that I didn't belong because I didn't fit the mold of a real American. This was a source of cognitive dissonance for me as I was born here and English is my primary language. Williams did what it could and acted within the norms of the time. I was a beneficiary of the trailblazing women who came a decade before, and I did not feel out of place as a female student at Williams in the 1980s. Being a minority, however, was the monkey on my back. Asian affinities groups existed at the time, but I stayed far away from them since I was an American, in quotes. I took solace that there were four Filipino Americans out of 500 plus students in the class, but mostly I tried to keep that part of myself hidden. That was quite a task, as I was hiding, as you can see, in plain sight. Because this was my storyline, I noticed and took it as a personal failure when things happened to me. The times when boyfriends wouldn't introduce me to their parents because I wasn't white. Being told by a friend that interracial marriage was wrong because the kids were ugly. People rolling down their car windows to yell racial slurs. One time I was sitting in a work meeting as one of two people of color, listening to a discussion of how if we made it a goal to hire more people of color, we would risk lowering the quality of the personnel. 
If I found the courage to speak about these things, often there would be denial from well-meaning people. Well, Nanette, I don't see you as a person of color. I see you as normal. <laughs> like my other memories, these are full technicolor sensory experiences, except without the good vibes. Because I believed in my American storyline, my response was to double down and to try harder. On the surface, the path of the ladder up the ladder looked good, and it was good. Went to Williams and to the Ivy League for graduate school. I was the first woman of color who led the fundraising offices at three places, including at my current place at the Hotchkiss School. I won awards and raised record amounts of money. With my smile as my calling card, I built a reputation around being, as my LinkedIn profile says, a joyful fundraiser and gifts attractor. I'm proud of my accomplishments, but there was a dark side and a cost. Over time, the accumulated stress of denying parts of myself resulted in years of chronic pain and illness. Part of my healing included my recognition of the chance to tell myself a new story, one that celebrates that I'm not just one identity, a real American in this case, but many. I am a complex human being. My work in education as a fundraiser and as a senior leader who is a woman of, col woman of color enabled me to step into this revised narrative. As schools began to seriously focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, so did I. I bore witness to underrepresented students at my school carrying their own burdens, and that was my path to healing. I knew I could help create an environment for students to thrive. I knew I could be a role model as others could see people who look like them occupy positions of leadership. I could use my education, power, and influence to create a better path, one based not on assimilation and conformity, but based in authenticity and the celebration of uniqueness. The stories we tell can harm or heal, and at this point in my life, I'm on the quest of healing and expansion for myself and for others. I want my own personal ripple effect not to be measured in the dollars I have raised, but in the small moments of grace and compassion where I help people feel that they can be more of who they are. Good vibes. I have a wish for today's students at Williams, and it is that they show up proudly as different and unique. And I have a wish for each of us, too, as we show up at reunion with our evolving storylines. When I was asked to speak today, I first thought of all the good memories I have of Williams, and that inspired me to volunteer and to come back for reunions. But I also remember my insecurities around not being good enough or not worthy. I've shared these with some trepidation today, and also with hope that in my vulnerability, I'm helping someone see and change old storylines and move into a place of healing. Institutions like William Williams have the power to break the mold of what it means to be a Williams student or a Williams alum by demonstrating that there is no one mold. There are as many molds as there are students and alumni. The focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion did not exist in the same way when we were at Williams, and I applaud what Williams is doing now. The work is important and meaningful, even life-changing. I applaud the work we each are doing in our own workplaces, communities, homes, and in ourselves to make rooms for the stories that yearn to be heard. I'm grateful to Williams. Even with my own personal angst, Williams created an environment where I could grow and thrive. It was small enough to know my teachers and classmates and big enough to have opportunities to try different things. I had the privilege of being surrounded by interesting, talented people and by osmosis became more interesting and talented myself. Williams generated a passion for lifelong learning, and it also nourished lifelong relationships and deep, abiding loyalty. My Williams friends are ride or die kind of friends. In fact, they gave me the courage to share my story today. And of course, I have Williams to thank for a lifelong love affair with my husband that has generated lots of laughs, unwavering support and hardship, and two awesome daughters, Liz and Christina, who, by the way, are very good looking. <laughs> I invite you to share the journey of healing with me. Let's celebrate each other's stories. We come from different walks of life, 
We have different occupations and passions. We have many identities. We are complex human beings. Let's lift each other up. We represent Williams in all its beauty and power to change the world to be what we want it to be. Let's do this. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Any former WCFM DJs like me in the room? Let me just check, yes! <laughs> One of my fondest memories um, at Williams was playing uh, Caribbean music uh, down in the WCFM room. It might be in somewhere where it's spiffier. It's gotten a lot spiffier since last I was here. It's a pleasure to be back. I have the privilege each day of collaborating with smart and passionate people working on climate and clean energy justice, which is a bomb for, of course, troubling times, and we're gonna talk about, as well, hope and lessons today. So much of what I learned at Williams, and so much of what I hmm, did not learn in class has brought me to this point, and so much about my experience outside of the classroom at Williams as well has gotten me here. I arrived at Williams from the Caribbean, from Trinidad and Tobago. I had not seen the campus. I didn't know it was a thing to go visit all the campuses before. I was thrilled to get an international scholarship and my Williams experience was catalytic for me. I did have a friend from high school that told me about this Williams place I went and looked it up, and I thought, interesting. And the brochures, the conversations about intellectual rigor, the pictures of the extracurricular activities, I was so thrilled to be here. There was one thing I knew for sure. I was gonna be working on issues of climate and environmental justice because the irony is oil money paid for my education. I was lucky uh, that I was born in a country that had oil revenues uh, that our first prime minister used uh, well to help get students who weren't from some of the wealthier uh, ex-colonial families to go into those schools. But what I also saw on my beautiful island was the damage that it was causing and so before I had fancy words for it, my goal was always to figure out how do we get the energy we need, the resources, the money that we need for the education, for those that might not already have resources without wrecking the things we hold dear. What I did not expect was how much issues around racial and economic inclusion would be central to solving those challenges. So I arrived at Williams and having watched a lot of American TV, Star Trek, <laughs> Sesame Street, I figured oh, there were some you know, issues. There are some folks you see on CNN that are angry. Um, but mostly everything's moving forward pretty fast uh, in a good way when it comes to diversity and inclusion. And that was a tough experience for me realizing that we were not quite where um, the, the vision was of where we hoped to be. And so one of the first ways in which Williams uh, shaped me and some of the lessons that uh, apply not just to the environmental field and, and others um, is that dealing with the issues around inclusion and diversity at Williams made me stronger for a lot of the issues we have to deal with today across all of our challenges, and particularly when it comes to climate, environment, and even our democracy. It's become clearer and clearer uh, that we have to emphasize that dealing with these issues is not just a nice thing to do, a welcoming thing to do, it is a moral thing to do, but a strategic thing to do. I became stronger 
from dealing with it, partly because of the strength of the Williams Alumni Network, and in particular, the Black Alumni Network, and leaders who came back and said, well, you should have seen it 10 years ago, but also those that said, wow, look at the amazing progress that has happened, and you run your leg stronger. And it's been a joy to come back to Williams and try to do the same for others. A second way that Williams shaped me as I look in the classroom um, is that we get taught we want to be academically rigorous. And that is absolutely critical. But what I realized after leaving Williams, um, after working in government, after working in climate, working in different stints in philanthropy, is that we have to expand our view and definition of what rigor looks like and where wisdom comes from. So I didn't realize, for instance, that the environmental movement was plagued with a lot of issues around inclusion on their boards, that environmental philanthropy when I entered, that it was rare for me to be there, and that these had profound implications for the kinds of solutions that were influenced. A study a few years ago, for instance, found that when you look at the biggest foundations, only 1.3% of the dollars from 12 of the biggest foundations went to organizations uh, that were run by people of color and community of, communities of color that looked rigorously at justice and equity components. And so while as we look at challenges from the pandemic to climate to others to our democracy, uh, we know we are fighting against forces that are challenging. Part of what we have to do to be rigorous um, and to solve challenges is recognize that if at home, in our spaces, in our schools, many of you are in leadership positions, if we are not looking rigorously at disparities, at those that um, are suffering, at systemic issues that might be producing, whether we intend to have it there or not, inequality, then we're gonna have a lot of challenges. But the upside and hopeful part of this is what we saw when I worked with some amazing leaders of all races in um, California, where there were a number of environmental organizations that said, we're going after a particular policy, it will bring down emissions, it will do a lot of good, and will raise a lot of money to then invest in cleaning up industry. And many leaders then said uh, that were from the communities that were most hurt. Some of those resources have to go directly to making sure we create jobs in the communities that need it the most. And many folks at that point said, but we're trying to solve climate change and reduce emissions. What do those two have to do with each other? We can talk about that later. Trickle-down environmentalism doesn't work any better than trickle-down economics. What was a beautiful story that came out of that is that a number of companies then tried to go and convince people with a campaign to overturn the entire climate law because they said it was bad for the poor. In other words, an equity argument. And because the original law had pulled together leaders that were both scholars and communities on the ground and systematically worked on something that was imperfect but better, uh, that campaign to try to overturn everything that happened didn't succeed because there were so many aspects of equity and inclusion and resources for those that needed the most built into it. It prevented a number of companies trying to undermine progress from saying, the do-gooders don't care about you once they get their solar panels. And that we can, going back to that question of, uh, oil money that paid for my education and what we want to solve, how we get both uh, policies and engagement and impacts 
that really help to solve both the climate challenge and bring others along in terms of economic inclusion. I had the honor of working at the Department of Energy, which is now doing a whole lot more around inclusion of jobs and supporting many organizations that are looking at that as well. There's a soft side to this, and so the thing I want to end with is about the power and joy that comes from working together. Because often when we uh, talk about these issues and challenge, it, it can seem like a heavy slog, and yet we're looking for uh, hope and for things we have not tried before. And it is a night and day difference in so many ways in terms of the attention that Williams and Maud are playing to recognizing uh, some of the challenges that Williams has had, being strong enough and resilient enough to face it, because that's how we then find a lot of the solutions uh, that we need. One of the reasons that uh, the National Academies, for instance, has someone like me on a panel talking about, or on a committee talking about climate and energy um, and inclusion is because even the National Academies, one of the most scientific elite institutions in our country, is recognizing if we're not pulling in wisdom from many different places and we're not looking rigorously, whether it's on our boards, how our companies are operating, where resources are going to, um, then we're not getting the ideal solutions. So in closing, Williams and its access and support and its challenges have allowed me to be able to leverage many of these assets for good. And lets us all try to be rigorous in the positions of influence that we are in to do the same. Not just because it's a moral thing to do, which it is, and we have to be, again, rigorous about it. Um, but also, it's because the smart, it's a smart and effective way for us to be investing our time, energy, and resources in reaching out to each other, in educating our children, in educating future Williams students. It's how we will protect our communities, our planet, and our democracy. So I thank you all for coming, and I thank you, Maud, for the work that you're doing to run the next leg of the relay better than the last one. Thank you. Before coming to Williams, I already felt like I didn't belong. I come from a small town in southwestern New Mexico where teenage pregnancy rates are among the highest in the country, where the dropout rates are discouraging, and those who did attend college did so close to home. For some time, I thought that staying close to home for college was perhaps what I wanted too, because that's mostly what I saw around me. A couple of years after we immigrated to the US from Mexico, my older sister and what, one of the smartest people I know um, and without knowing English before the move, she decided to attend college in state and commuted two hours from home. She was one of my role models, so I thought that if she had a good option to go to college, then if I decided to stay home too, then I would also have those same good options. I also had a strong group of friends who pushed each other academically, um, but I still didn't feel like I belonged there or that that was quite what I wanted to have if... Um, what I, what I wanted for myself. My sophomore year of high school, I started dating a senior who also came from a low-income background. His dream school was MIT, which he learned more about from QuestBridge, which is a nonprofit organization that helps connect low-income, high-achieving students with top-tier colleges who, that provide outstanding financial aid. Hearing him talk about his aspirations to leave the state um, and the options to attend a private school with grants uh, made me feel for the first time that that, is, that was perhaps a possibility and a choice that I could make for myself. When my turn came to learn more about QuestBridge 
and their partner colleges. I, of course, didn't pay attention to anything that Williams had to say. I focused a lot more on the places that I recognized and names that I knew other people at home would recognize too. Places like Yale, Brown, MIT, Stanford. Thankfully for me though, Williams didn't know any of that and they invited me to apply to their all expenses fly-in program, uh, which was called Windows on Williams. And it was an opportunity to spend an all expenses paid trip uh, to learn a little bit more about the college and the student and academic life uh, for three days. Williams, I thought. I kind of recognized that name as the Quest Birch Partner School. Okay, so they have good financial aid, check. In a region of the country I've never been to before, check. And I could go for free, check. So that sounded like a really good opportunity for me, so I decided to apply. And when I visited campus, I fell in love with the place instantly. Yes, part of it was because of the beautiful job that the admission office does to make students feel welcomed on campus. Also, as somewhat of a square person, I love the attention to detail that everything, uh, that every part of the program had on campus, from the shuttle pickups to the meal times to the midnight hike. I saw that everything was really well thought out, but most importantly, the students and the faculty here seemed to be really engaged and happy here with each other. They had their critiques too, of course, but ultimately the way they talked about their experiences sounded like a place where I could see myself 2,000 miles from home and away from everything and everyone that was familiar to me. After all, I had done a similar thing in sixth grade when I moved to the US, so I felt like I could do it again, but this time speaking the same language, at least. Um, and we spoke the same language here, but I had a lot of different experiences from my peers. While I came from a Title I school with 100% free and reduced price lunch, a small border town that is religious and conservative, from a single parent household in which that parent did not attend college, many of my peers came from, um, came from prep school or well-resourced places with doctor or lawyer parents. So naturally, I felt out of place, um, especially when some of my classmates and entermates talked about their perfect or near perfect standardized test scores, about their travels, or about their club sports. That was when I first felt what I later learned to be imposter syndrome. That nagging feeling that I wasn't good enough to be here or that everyone else was simply better than me. And on several occasions, I wondered what it was that the admission office saw in me that made them think that I could fit in. One of the sadder things about feeling this way though was that I wasn't the only one. It wasn't also just students who looked like me or who came from similar backgrounds as me, though. My first year, I walked onto the track team with the, encouragement, with the encouragement of one of my JAs, where I met a lot of people from all walks of life, and where initially I thought that the only thing that seemed to connect us was the event in which we participated. I was wrong, obviously, because we had so much more in common than I thought, including that they too occasionally thought that they were way, way in over their head at Williams. It took a lot of conversations with that same JA during my first year to see that it wasn't that I wasn't good enough or that my peers weren't good enough or that we didn't deserve to be here. It took a while to see and to internalize that um, everyone had vastly different starting points at Williams and that it wasn't fair to myself to compare my failures and my successes to other people because we had vastly different upbringings and academic preparation. It took a while to understand that while I may not have known at the time what exactly it was that the admission office saw in me, they saw something and I wasn't going to question that. What I needed to do instead was to find the people and create the communities that I wanted and that I needed to feel like I could thrive personally and academically. Coming to the, that realization was really freeing and exactly what I needed that I needed to do things for myself and not for the expectations that I thought others had of me. But I also didn't know if other people knew that they could do that too, that they know that they could do things without the expectations of others looming over their heads. Um, some of my closest friends and people I hung out with on campus were also students of color, um, students from low income and first generation backgrounds. The Quest chapter on campus and VISTA, the Latinx organization on campus, were some of the places I felt the safest and where I found community. And that's also where I, where I heard similar sentiments about feeling like we don't belong. So I thought, what if I could be a part of a team 
whose role was to create uh, those safer spaces for other students on campus. But how to do that in a way that felt authentic to me, to my experiences, and to the people I most wanted to serve. Luckily for me, the college, um, the, the same year that I started at Williams, Williams uh, hired, the dean's office hired a new dean to focus specifically on initiatives for first-generation students on campus. She was a wonderful first-gen Latina, eager to strengthen the first-gen group on campus and to simply make a scene for the thriving, trailblazing community that we are. That dean, uh, Rosanna Ferro, which many of us knew while we were on campus, would turn out to be instrumental to me having an overall positive experience in college. With her as my mentor, I finally understood what it, the importance of having representation in positions of power and the positive impact that seeing people who look like me has in my morale, in my learning, and in those of similar peers. At the end of my first year, I applied to be part of the inaugural first-gen orientation leadership team. And with a lot of support from Dean Farrow, we were tasked with creating workshops for incoming first-year, first-gen students to navigate to figure out how to navigate the college, how to communicate with their families, and how to take advantage of the resources that already exist. Being an orientation leader was an incredible experience to get ahead of everything and show and remind first year students that this was a place for them to claim as their own too. They belonged and they deserved to be here and they needed to try their best, whatever that was, without comparing themselves to others because everyone has a different story and a different starting point. After that, with a lot of mentoring from Dean Farrow, I just sought opportunities that allowed me to encourage others to tell their own stories, to be confident in the people they are now, and to understand that and internalize that they matter and that their experiences matter too. Together and also with the help of many other first-gen students, some of whom are alumni sitting here right now in this auditorium, and thanks to former Dean April Ruiz and now Deans Rebecca Garcia and Janice Williams, we helped establish what is now a fully fleshed out, thriving program, the Williams First, which, was, which is now to support not only first generation students who are the first in their family to attend and graduate from a four year institution, but also others who are the first in some way in their community to go to a place like Williams. I became a JA later because I wanted to support other first gen low income students in their everyday first year experiences to help guide them through some of their largest transitions on campus. And upon graduating, I worked in the admission office here because I wanted to be part of that team that created those same and even more welcoming experiences that attracted me to the college in the first place and that made me feel welcome. Now as one of the co-chairs for the Williams First Alumni Network, I strive to expand the network of support for alumni, especially to those who did not have that type of community as students and who did not feel like they could connect with others based on their first generation identity. The support I've received from and provided to communities at and outside of Williams is also exactly what drew me to medicine because I wanna provide comfort and create safer spaces for other people, especially the underserved, low-income, Spanish-speaking populations. It really fills my cup to see other people gain confidence in their abilities and to try, um, to try new things that they wouldn't have tried when they felt like they weren't good enough or that they didn't know enough. For me, it is a lifelong pursuit to help others see themselves for the wonderful, interesting people that their friends and the people who surround them see them to be, and to help them understand that they do belong in these spaces and that we are all just at different starting points in our life. Thank you. Uh, we're um, going to ha have to say goodbye and thank you to this wonderful panel. I just wanted to note the, the metaphor used of moving the relay uh, forward, um, I think is such a wonderful way to wrap up this panel because I think what you see here is a multi-generational process at Williams um, where uh, once upon a time, uh, 50 years ago, um, some inspired uh, from the ground and from the top leadership came together to open the door to women uh, at Williams. Um, and then over time, generation after generation uh, has continued to do the work uh, that is required to make this place um, an, 
ever growing uh, and changing um, and never perfect, but always in the work of perfection uh, community. And I really just want to really thank the four of you for sharing your stories and for all of you uh, for participating by listening so intently. Thank you so much. Thank you.